Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coming Clean with Indy Lee. I'm your host, Indy Lee, and in today's episode, we are sitting down with Connor Begley. Connor is one of the co-founders of Tribe Dynamics. Now, Tribe is one of the leading authorities in social analytics and used by top global fashion, beauty, and lifestyle brands. I cannot wait to dive in with him and talk about what he's been up to. Okay, so I'm sitting down virtually um, from one coast to another with Connor. And first of all, I don't, I actually, I wrote this to you, but I don't know if you remember it. I met you back in, I think it was 2013, 2014 at a CEW event um, where Tribe was just kind of coming onto the scene. Yes, it was very early for us. Yeah, and I was super impressed um, as a brand had no money, so couldn't do it. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'll be honest. But I mean, it's incredible to watch what you've done. I mean, you've really grown this into a tech marketing powerhouse, really. Ah, thank I, you. I've been, um, I've been stalking. I've been watching for quite some time. <laughs> I subscribe to the the reports, absolutely. So thank you for taking time just to you know come on the podcast and talk to me because I actually have been a huge fan for um, now almost. Oh my God, almost a decade. <laughs> That's crazy to think. It's super weird. Super weird. It's so it's, weird. Um, I was just reflecting on it with our uh, executive vice president who's been with us now for coming up on uh, six or five years. And it's just like, just in the last five years, so much has happened. It's like, yeah. you know, we both had babies, mul- in our case, multiple babies, bought a house, moved out to the suburbs. The business has grown by 8X during that time. Like, it's just, crazy um so it's been a been a fun experience um well congratulations still, still a long well ways deserved. to go though. Uh, listen it's a journey it's not a sprint yeah. right as i yeah. like to say so you founded try back in 2012 with your long-term friend and college friend i believe right john namneth and yes. it was really interesting when i was doing the research you really went on like your intuition a lot on this and your backgrounds but my experience is that successful founders like yourself, it's a, it's more than that. It's passion or a pain point that they're trying to solve and they make yep. it their purpose. Right. And so what I've learned in the little uh, Googling that I've been doing and listening about you um, yeah. is that you guys were really very passionate about entrepreneurialism and beer. I, I learned that <laughs> also listening to about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we are both very passionate. I'm probably more passionate than my co-founder about beer. He does like beer as well, though. Yeah, for sure. And um, and that you really want to create a business that was solving a problem. So yeah. I was hoping you could share a little bit about how that kind of came to fruition and really how your passion for entrepreneurialism started Tribe. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is I think growing up, I actually had a negative connotation when it came to entrepreneurs, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, Growing up, my mom was at her company for 30 years. My dad was at his company for 30 years. So literally from the time that I knew what was going on to the time that they retired, they were at the same place. And so for me, uh, entrepreneur actually was kind of like, a oh, so you don't have like a real job, right? Right, um, yeah. Because this was, this was before it had really gotten mythologized in a significant way like it is today. Yeah, so I was actually not, I wasn't super passionate about it at first. But then what happened was when I came out of school, I joined a startup called reputation.com. When I started, they were about 30 employees. And then by the time that I left, it was 300. And that was just in a couple of years. So I got to see this this pretty rapid trajectory. And I was like, oh, wow, like this is really cool. Like I really dig this. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I think the initial seed got planted for me in terms Mm -hmm. of that that particular space. Exactly, right? Like I'm sure you have. Yep. And um, (laughs) You know, from there, John and I, you know, we went to school together and he was a couple grades ahead of me. And but, you know, we would stay up late and, you know, drink beer drink and talk beers. about business. <laughs> yeah, which was not, you know, but that wasn't what most people were doing I in know. college. Yeah. And so uh, so anyway, so around that time, he was also at a software company that had grown quite rapidly. And so we would kick around different ideas for starting a company. Um, and at one point, I remember this, it, we we sat down for wine. We wrote down, OK, what? Let's write down 10 ideas. And then we went to revisit it like six months or a year later. And it was like nine of the 10 were companies. We're like, okay, yeah, wow. this convinced us. You're we like, should wait be doing a minute. This. I wait mean, a minute. I, I know a thing or two about a thing or two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows? But that was definitely the spark, right? Um, but we didn't start one immediately. So I went to Australia with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. 
and you know initially went out there just to travel so we went to bali thailand new zealand we kind of used uh melbourne as our home amazing. base amazing yeah um and so that was awesome but then ended up doing some consulting for this really cool up and coming brewery so they made beer ironically i'm i'm um, seeing a trend here i got to say yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny didn't expect so much of this to be about beer but um <laughs> You know, we realized that for us, the bars were kind of influencers because, mm-hmm. you know, they'd have 800 to 1,000 fans on their Facebook fan page. But those 800 to 1,000 people were the bartenders, the owners, the locals. It was a highly concentrated audience. And so, you know, we would go to these bars. We'd shoot some really cool photography. We'd interview the bartenders. And we'd publish these Facebook albums called Our Favorite Bars and Bartenders. Um, you know, it would have like the bartender interviewed and cool photos and the mm-hmm. bars would see it. They'd share it onto their Facebook fan page. The bartenders would see it. They'd get pumped because, you know, they don't get to send things to their mom that often about what how they work and what they do. <laughs> and so you get to send that to them like, look, I have, you know, look at me. Um, and so, yeah, and then we'd see our sales increase in those bars. And so I was talking to John. I was like, you know, what's really weird is like bars didn't used to have like fans, right? They didn't create yeah. content. Um, And really what's happening here is, um, you know, there's been a fundamental change in the infrastructure surrounding publishing such that publishing and distributing information just doesn't cost as much as it used to. I mean, that's the reason that you and I can do this podcast right now, right? If we had to have like, you know, a physical studio and a radio network and all these things, we never would have been able to do it. And so, um, and that's happening all over the place, right? With photography, audio, uh, video, everything. So... Um, so yeah, so that was the initial spark. And then I think we got particularly passionate just about being entrepreneurs after that, right? Like after mm-hmm. we got into it and it's like, oh wow, like, you know, we're just learning so much as part of this process. And, um, I can't imagine going back to working. I mean, um, I don't know. No, me neither. So. Oh me, yeah, obviously me neither. I mean, you <laughs> really pioneered a lot of the, the analytics on social sharing. So maybe even share with the listeners on what tribe is and what it does. That's probably a great way to dive in. Yeah, totally. So we are a software and data company. Um, We work primarily in the the lifestyle sector. So beauty was our initial core category. Then we moved into fashion and have gotten fairly dominant there across both luxury and fast fashion. And then have recently grown quite quickly in fitness and have started dabbling in entertainment and food and Bev. Um, So in terms of what it actually does, is it's a tool to help brands manage and track their influencer relationships. So, and the reason that's become so important is if you look at it from a scale perspective, you know, Gucci will have 11,000 influencers that will create 300,000 pieces of content about them each year just in the US. So, for them, you know, that's you can't manage that in Google Sheets, right? You can't manage that in Excel. Um, it's just too too complicated. It's hard to do even 100 these days. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And on you top of that. You spend your time adding data to a spreadsheet than actually analyzing it. Exactly. And so, um, and then on top of that, I think that people are starting to put significant amounts of money into this, um, spending frankly hundreds of millions of dollars a year or more, and they need to know whether it's working or not. Right. And they can't just rely on, um, you know, simple metrics. And so mm-hmm. we've really tried to spend the time to understand like, you know, how is all of this stuff translating to business success? And how do we measure it in a way that is, um, you know, consistent with the actual impact that it's having? And I think that's an incredibly hard problem to solve, but um, we work on it every day, right, to try and make it better mm-hmm. and better. And so, and to help point people in the right directions. Because I think early on when we started, you know, we really, people are really focused on campaigns, they're really focused on paying influencers. And I think what we found is that the brands that do really well at this actually focus much more on long-term relationship building um, and much more on um, like this is kind of PR and earned content, earned media. So I think that we have tried to figure out ways to kind of point people in that direction because there are certain things that, you know, ColourPop is doing that other people are not. And there are certain things that um, you know, Tatcha was doing or Tula is doing or these other brands are doing that um, others are not. And so how do we use metrics to point people in that direction so that mm-hmm. they are, you know, um, 
getting the best uh, for their investments. The benchmark these days is EMV, right? Earned media value, yep. which yep. correct me if I'm wrong, you guys pretty much invented. <laughs> <laughs> I think it existed in some obscure format prior to that, but, but I would say that we were the ones who the, popularized it. Yeah, yeah, for, sure, for, for sure. sure. Because it gives us a baseline. And when I say us, I mean a brand, a baseline to say, does this make sense? And puts yep, everybody, yep. like puts all the influencers kind of at a, okay, here's the level that we're going to rate everybody. And this one is going to have more impact than this. And you can see what quote unquote campaigns, and I mean, just in terms of an interaction yeah, with yeah, an yeah. influencer, what is it doing? How is it moving the needle? And is it somebody to really build that long-term relationship to? Because let's face it, for a brand, it's it's also dollars um, in terms of spend. But for an influencer, it's about um, what's the relationship I want to have with a brand? Yeah, it's a tough balance, right? Because I think that as a brand, obviously you want to work with the people that are going to, you know, have the most impact for you and that are going to help you grow. Um, but it's hard to figure out who those people are, right? It's really tough yeah. to figure out where you should be investing. And um, and it gets where it gets really messy is you start to think about, um, it's not just about your relationship and my relationship. So say you're a brand and I'm mm -hmm. an influencer. And, you know, um, and you say, Hey, I love Connor. He's doing great stuff. You know, look at his hair. His hair is so great. I want to work with him. <laughs> I've I'm been a hair thinking about the whole time. <laughs> I don't think you have. My hair is like, this has been the same since like eighth grade. Right. But, um, so as you can tell, it's like still, you know, par partly in sync. So, um, but then what you don't think about is like, okay, say I decide to go and work with Connor. Well, I am inherently choosing him over someone else, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and particularly if you choose somebody who's like not been a big fan to the brand historically, all the people that have been a big fan as a brand go, hey, why are you paying him and you're not paying me? Exactly. Right? Like I love mm -hmm. the brand and you're not supporting me. Um, and then they become less likely to talk about you. So mm -hmm. in isolation, you know, your work with me could look good. But holistically, it could actually be missing really big yeah. parts of the impact. Um, and frankly, those, I think, end up being more important than than the actual campaign itself. I so. completely agree. I mean, as someone who I'm, I'm very lucky that we've had some brand enthusiasts since the get go. And it was for me, it was always about creating authentic relationships and building a co true community. I mean, for me, Indie Lee was about creating a community and empowerment. It was the the products actually just serve to underline that community, to be honest with you. And so it's having that true holistic relationship. Um, and now as we start to look at how we're working with influencers, it's how do we work with influencers who have been there all along? But the other thing that I love about Tribe is that you're doing the listening for the brands because it's very hard especially on some of these social platforms that it's gone. It's like, if you didn't catch it, you didn't catch it and you don't even yeah. know there's a mention and you as a brand want to interact with that person and say, thank you. And so I love that tribe actually not only is giving you some benchmark information, but also capturing the data that you could so easily miss unless you have somebody who's spending 24 seven on every platform. Yeah, it's a big part of the problem that we solve as well as, you know, it's not just about Instagram, right? You mm -hmm. have TikTok and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and their website and your blog. And so I think being able to bring all of that into a single location um, just ends up saving people a lot of time and make sure you don't miss things, right? Because yeah, like, absolutely. Um, so yeah, no, it's a big part of the value we try to bring for sure. So how quickly did you realize that beauty was where you're going to go to? Because you guys weren't beauty enthusiasts, right? As far as I know, as you just said, you've had the same hair do since, you know, eighth grade. <laughs> so beauty wasn't like your thing. Like why beauty? Was it that you saw that the influ beauty influencers were really what influencers started out? But you just said, you know, you also were working on beer, of course. <laughs> so like how did, how is that your focus? I'm so fascinated by that. Like two guys are like, yeah, I'm going into beauty. Nope. Don't know anything about it, but that's the area. Yeah. We had zero background. Um, I can tell you it's, I did not expect to know this much about the beauty industry. Uh, when we started <laughs> like you trying. are like a beauty person. <laughs> I'm like now. a beauty guy now. Like I think yeah, I'm one of so the more well-connected people in beauty. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's fascinating. It's just weird, and it's like your well, roster I can't... of people is like a who's who, and I'm like, God dang, he's connected. <laughs> it's awesome. It is fantastic and well deserved and earned. Don't get me wrong, but how yeah, did you get yeah, there? No, it's not. Yeah, definitely not the plan. Um, 
Well, I think there's a few things, right? So, um, you know, when we first started out and you're like, you have this kind of rough idea of, okay, there's all these people out here, right? In our case with the brewery, it was like, okay, I'm a brewery. There's all these bars out there. I want to know what bars have big social presences and who do I need to be reaching out to and how to keep track of all this. Um, so we went out and started talking to all different types of businesses, right? So we talked to, you know, beauty, fashion, this, that, the other thing. And I think um, early on, we found kind of a signal in beauty, right? Which was, because when we started this, this was 2012. This is a long time ago. Um, this was before, I mean, I think Instagram may have just started to exist. Just started, yeah. Like we had, we had internal debates as to whether we should support Instagram. We're like, <laughs> do we want to add it to the platform? Like, I don't know. Like, Good is it going to gonna stick around? Yeah, so <laughs> it was literally, that, it was that early. And so... Um, you know, we went out, talked to a bunch of people and, you know, there was this early signal of like beauty brands being interested in talking with us and beauty brands generally being very interested in the influencer space before other brands were right. So that was the first signal. And then the second one was, you know, when we first started the company, I was like, oh God, I don't know anything about business. I need to read every business book on earth. Right. And I tried to read every single one that I could. And so, and what's really interesting about when you dive really deeply into a topic like that is you can read, you know, multiple books from multiple experts who each have their own individual perspective. And you can start to find some truths across those different perspectives. So I remember reading, there's a few different books. One was called Crossing the Chasm. Another one was called Zero to One by Peter Thiel. And I can't remember the other one. Um, but what they all centered on was if you look at uh, kind of high growth technology companies, what you find really consistently is those that have been successful tended to focus on a particular niche where their technology was significantly more important and then to really dominate that niche and then to move into kind of other areas that are horizontally similar, right? And so, you know, an example of that would be PayPal. So when PayPal first started, right, PayPal is about transferring money online. And for us, that's an obvious thing now. But when PayPal started, which I think it was like 1999, right? I think it was around that time. Like yeah. people didn't send money online. People didn't no. trust the internet with their credit cards. No, like it, was it was not eBay. like eBay. Yeah, right? And that's so for PayPal- Exactly. Right. And so for for PayPal, you know, what they focused on was like, OK, you know, there is a group of people where they are transferring money constantly online. And that was eBay. Right. And so and the people were, you know, I'm listing and selling my Mickey Mouse figurine for six dollars and seventy five cents. And what would happen, right, is like if I wanted to buy that from you, I would have to write you a physical check and then mail that to you. And so if you're dealing with thousands of these purchases, it's incredibly problematic. And so if you look at PayPal at the beginning, 95% of their revenue came specifically from eBay. They were just eBay power sellers. And yeah. that's what they really focused their product on. And then over time, they've taken on more and more and more as payments have become more and more well accepted, right? Digitally. Yeah. And I think now they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars. I don't know the exact number, but it's massive, right? And so I think for us, you know, reading those books and then seeing that signal in beauty, we said, hey, if we really focus on this group, um, you know, number one, it's much more important to them, right? So they're going to be more likely to adopt new technology to solve yep. the problem. Um, and number two, if we really focus on this group, we can build something that is much, much better with less resources, right? So, you you know, if I tried to build an influencer tool that worked for entertainment and beauty and fashion and gaming and all these things out of the gate, um, that's an incredibly complex tool. It takes a yes. lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources, and it's very hard to get right. And so uh, alternatively, if you just focus on one type of customer and you build something that really fits them well, you can start there and then build on top of it over time. And what you've done is incredible because you truly have been scaling past the beauty, as you said, into the fashion, into lifestyle, yep. into wellness and above and beyond from that platform. And truly, when I think about it, beauty makes so much sense because so much was relied on the influence was from the publishing industry, which was really going through such change and then yep. becoming these people, these online YouTubers, then, you know, Instagram. So it makes sense, like logically now looking back on it. But what was influencers then, which what is influencers today? Like, yep. Did you know that this was going to change? Like, did you, again, see the gut change in the, what was happening in the publishing, like I was saying? 
you'd like to say that like, like the thing I look at is if you look at Google searches for influencer mm -hmm. marketing from around the time that we started to today, it's grown over a hundred X during that time. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's not many things when you like start a business that you enter an industry that grows over a hundred X in a, you know, a 10 year time span or less. And in this case, like, you know, call it eight, nine years. So it would be hard to say that we could have predicted. Yeah, it, right? I was like, I, think, I mean, you guys, I was like, whoa. Yeah. I and mean, there's a lot of luck there, right? Like, I think that, uh, you know, at the same time, we very much had a thesis, right? We had a right. thesis, which is, okay, I as a consumer, because John came from the ad industry, right? So he did a lot of Google ads and these other things. He's like, who's clicking on these ads? He's like, this is not how I decide how to buy a product, right? He's like, the way I decide how to write a, buy a product is like, I follow somebody, I follow a blogger who gives me a really good recommendation or my friend tells me. So it's like when you thought about how people learned about things and what the best source of information is, like mm -hmm. ads, ads are not a good source of information. But what is a really good source of information is like Manny, the makeup artist who's got 5 million fans, all he does all day long, every day for the last 10 years is work with makeup. And he is telling me that this is better than this and this, right? I That's love that a you really know Ma Manny the makeup. I love that you oh, know. Oh, of course, that. right? Manny <laughs> Mua. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, love, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but no, but it's so true. I mean, when you think about it, why an ad is someone paying to get my eyeball on it versus someone who is doing this on a regular basis and fell in love with the product. And who's an expert, right? They're an expert exactly. in the topic and they're not doing this because generally because they're, they're not doing this because they're getting paid. And in a lot of ways, right? Like they're actually held to a fairly high standard because, yes. you know, if they're out there recommending shitty products, pardon my language, but if they're out there recommending crappy products. I put the expletive, it's fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> so, um, you know, if they go out there and they're putting out poor quality products and recommending them, then what happens is I lose trust in you, right? I go, hey, why did you recommend that? That doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. And over time, that really erodes the trust yeah. that they have in the audience. That's and their that's currency. Why, exactly, Trust right? is their currency. Yeah, sure. and so it holds them to... Frankly, I think an even higher standard than the traditional beauty magazines, right? Which is like, you know, if you're an editor for a beauty magazine, of course you care about the success of the magazine, but you're going to leave eventually. It doesn't really matter that much. But, you know, this is like their identity. Like if they mm -hmm. lie or if they misrepresent or if they don't, um, you know, recommend products that they truly believe in, in the long run, it does not work out well for them, right? I mean, look at cancel culture these days. These days, I mean, it's you have to be on your game and really speaking from the heart and the things about, you know, and you have to also be squeaky clean yeah. because people are looking for that authentic relationship. They're looking for an emotional connection with a brand and with an influencer. And so both sides of the coin need to have a true relationship. But that's now with paying things have changed, right? Yep. You now have yep. to say you're, this is a sponsored. Have you seen that? How have you seen that change the industry? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that there's a variety of ways that you can pay people, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can pay them in product, right? So I'm going to send you some product. You don't have to talk about it, but if you want to talk about it, go for it, right? You can pay people in exposure. So you can say, Hey, you know, whenever somebody talks about me, I'm going to share that onto my own Instagram channel or like, Hey, I'm going to take this person. I'm going to put them in all of the Sephora doors that I'm in across the country on the actual, you know, the gondola. Right. And, um, and those are ways that, you know, that drives exposure for them and drives value. Um, you can pay people in what is the most traditional sense, which is like, Hey, I'm going to pay you to post about this. Right. Um, the problem that you run into there. And the reason that I think that is kind of the least effective all, of all the payment methods is every time a pub, an influencer publishes content that's an advertisement, they lose a little bit of their audience trust, right? Just a little bit. Yeah. And so, you know, I when I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see hashtag ad, hashtag spawn, sponsored by, I'm like, Ugh, and just, you know, skip past as quickly as you can. And so you're asking them to do something that is intentionally harming their brand and their business. And so alternatively, if you were to say, hey, I love what you're doing. I'm such a big fan of you. I'd like to co-create a 
product collection. Or I love you so much, I'd like to bring you in and make you the face of the brand on the website. Or I would like to bring you in and make you a long-term, you know, like Nike has athletes, right? Like a Mm long-term athlete to my particular apparel company. Um, And I don't care. Like you talk about it when you talk about it. You can, you know, when they're in co-developing the product, they're going to take photos because it's so cool. It's such a cool experience for them to talk about. Like that's something that doesn't inherently hurt their audience, particularly if there's somebody who has proactively talked about you in the past, right? And so I think what's happened over time is the sophistication around how you pay people has gotten a lot better. It's still not great, right? There's still a lot of people that are doing things that they don't realize are, are not only not positive for their brands, but proactively negative for their brands. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that sophistication has gotten better. And partially because you had a series of companies like a ColourPop or an Anastasia or a Huda or a, you know, Drunk Elephant or a whatever that have achieved these very large outcomes from an acquisition or valuation perspective um, that have done things differently, right, than L'Oreal does them. And I think that people are learning from that because people are smart and they figure these things out, uh, but it's still very, very early. But now everything is changing yet again, and you're seeing more and more platforms arrive on the scene. I mean, TikTok came on in like two years by storm, Now you're seeing Clubhouse join the ranks. How does that shape your business? And how do you see that shaping the industry? I mean, you see it firsthand. You have that data before everybody else does, to be honest. Well, some of our brands would argue with you. They'd they'd say we're pretty slow. But I think that um, (laughs) it's both, uh, It's I mean, it's obviously challenging, right? As a company, Mm -hmm. you're having to keep track of all these different channels and you know, for us, investing in a new channel is non-trivial, right? So it costs a lot of money and time and effort and focus to get really good at TikTok, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so we have to be very intentional with how we make those choices. But generally, I would say that um, we are known for being kind of the most comprehensive uh, out there when it comes to monitoring this kind of stuff. I think that um, Longer term, I think it's much healthier for the ecosystem for there to be more platforms rather than less, right? Like when Facebook controls, you know, 80% of social content, like that's not good for anybody, right? Yeah. And this is nothing against Facebook, right? I no. love Facebook. They've done a great job. They're a fantastic business. But I think it's better generally for the ecosystem to have more players. So, yeah, so I think for us, we have to continue to stay on top of that and make decisions. I think that um, we obviously made the decision to support TikTok, which is, you know, I would say about two thirds rolled out and will be fully rolled out over the next couple of months. We haven't started supporting Clubhouse or any other of the uh, kind of new newer folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's something we constantly have to keep track of. And I think yeah. in a lot of ways, right, our brands end up being a really good signal there for whether or not we should. You know, it's like we're hearing a growing chorus around Twitch. It's like, hmm, interesting. Like I wouldn't have picked Twitch. But uh, yeah, so I think our brands end up being a really good guide. Uh, for this kind of stuff, which is nice. And I think that to your point, the competition is good, right? To have uh, other platforms and kind of evens the playing field a little bit, um, both for early adopters. So maybe some, you know, influencers got on TikTok before, you know, earlier than people who became influencers on Instagram or YouTube. So they have an opportunity to kind of capture a market early on. Absolutely. And that's, I mean... It's, uh, we're, we're working on, it's top secret, so don't tell anybody. I um, won't, no, this is but, not uh, going on the podcast. <laughs> we are, uh, working on a product for the creators. Um, it's still very early days. We have about 125, um, influencers that are testing the product right now that helps them to have the same kinds of analytics that a brand would have, as well as helps them to reach out to brands so they can actually find direct contact information for you know, who's the VP of communications at, um, uh, you know, Josie Marin, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that's a big project that we're working on right now that mm-hmm. I think is critically important. And I think in the long run, you know, we have all the brands on one side of the equation and then all the influencers on the other side. And generally we have tried to kind of stay out of that relationship, right? To allow mm-hmm. them to connect directly with each other because that's what we've observed as kind of best practices, Um, But at the same time, I do think there are things that we can do to make those relationships a lot easier to manage, right? Whether that's 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, like, for example, for us, you know, we use something called scission, right? So yeah. how are we going to get in touch? Because we want to reach out, and sometimes you don't have an email. You don't know what the con, you know, especially in publishing where people are moving around. So you're like, okay, wait, no, they're not at this one. They're at that one. So it's how do you connect? And my other question was, so Tribe is really for brands to get that understanding of an EMV that an, that an influencer or content creator could potentially have for them and to see what impact they have across the board, various different brands. Do you select the influencers or is this just you're listening to what's going on in the community and saying, okay, this is someone to add to our list of like tribe verified? So we try to be as comprehensive as we can, right, from a monitoring perspective. So our goal is to really measure the entire influencer ecosystem mm -hmm. and then how you're performing within that ecosystem. So obviously with things like TikTok, you know, um, I think that that's a newer channel. It takes a little bit more time to like become comprehensive there, right? A real investment. This is where the emerging platforms discussion comes into play, right? Which is going to be a little bit of a pivot from your question back to the old, the old okay. topic. But um, one of the things that's really interesting when we started talking to these influencers, right? So now that we're working with these influencers with this new app, is there, you know, you're seeing, like we're having conversations with these people and what they're all telling me is like, it's really hard to grow on Instagram, right? We're having a really hard time gaining traction there, but like TikTok is a new platform where we can gain a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. And so they are shifting, like there was this uh, one woman, Rosalyn, who in a fairly small audience on Instagram, started talking, doing videos on TikTok, does I believe eight to 12 a day, which is just unbelievable. But she's now up to 600,000 fans, right? And the other thing that on TikTok, and the other thing that they were talking about I thought was really interesting is, you know, we're seeing a real decline in makeup specific content. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking to these creators, you know, one of the things that Rosalind talked about was like, when I started growing really quickly, I started talking about my life. Like makeup was part of that, but it wasn't just makeup, 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 makeup after one after another. And so, um, yes, it's quite interesting to monitor I'm really excited about this part of our business because I think that we're going to learn a lot about the creators mm -hmm. themselves when we form these relationships, as well as, um, yeah, they're, they're clearly embracing new platforms, which is quite interesting. I love it. I, and I think that the way to have these real relationships is not just, I mean, yes, you want to follow people who are specialists or experts in their area, but you want to know more about them than just how they apply makeup and what their favorite makeup is. You want to know what they're eating. You want to know where their favorite place to go. They want, you want to know about their life because that's how you establish trust. Absolutely. If you're only just seeing this peripheral part of it, how do you gain trust other than, yep, that person's really good at eyeshadow. Yep. And so I think it's really interesting to watch influencers start to branch out. I know as a founder, one of the things I'm challenging myself is to take my personal Instagram page yep. and be more vulnerable on it because I want to have that emotional connection. It doesn't really necessarily belong on the brand page, yep. but I want people to get to know me as a person. If I say I want to build a community, I want to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's that. And then how to like using Clubhouse, you know, power of audio where people are doing things, you know, multitasking. How do I bring that networking, that um, founder story and founders stories to life. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see. One of the things that's really hard, I think, about being vulnerable like that, right, is like, I think that generally, you know, we've been trained not to complain, right? We've been trained not to air our grievances. Um, we've been trained not to um, be seen as negative, right? And that's something that I always struggled with in terms of being vulnerable digitally, is like, how do you find this balance between, you know, helping people to learn from your experiences and the things that have gone wrong for you um, while also not being perceived as uh, complaining or, and it's also just not, I think generally something I think about, right? Like I'm, I tend to be mm -hmm. very forward looking. Like I, we obviously reflect back and try to learn from things, but mm -hmm. don't spend a ton of, you know, an immense amount of time there. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough balance. Um, it is. Yeah. It is. I'll let you know how it goes. See, my goal is to be one of those high ranking people on tribe. Just me personally. <laughs> there you go. I mean, there's a lot of money there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, I don't have enough on my plate. Yeah. You got lots you know, of extra time, right? I, no, exactly. But for me, it really is, you know, I've never wanted to just be skincare. I wanted people to live their life in the most 
healthy, empowered way. Yeah. And so I'm I'm learning to see what platforms to use. So it'll be really interesting to see how I rank, which is like not even showing up yet. <laughs> I wouldn't show up either. So it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I know what's next for Tribe, but my question is always at the end. Um, you're an entrepreneur. You're now I know you're a dad. So a lot has happened in the 12 or 10 years since I've seen you. Yes. Um, how do you find time for yourself? Because you have, I mean, you ha can't pour from an empty cup. <laughs> I think it's really tough, right? I think that um, this is the way I've always thought about it, right? Is um, you have to be intentional with how you spend your time, right? So I spend a lot of time thinking about how I spend my time. Um, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that, there's this article I always really liked. I can't remember what school she was at, but she was running a... a a small to medium college on the East Coast. And it was a letter actually targeted more towards um, women than, than men, right? But it was, um, you know, basically, um, there's a lot of pressure put on women to be, you know, the mom that's all the school meetings and to be the partner at the law firm and to be the perfect wife and to be all these different things. And she's like, the reality is that if you want to be the partner at the law firm, you know, you don't get every night and every weekend to yourself, right? You don't get to go to every soccer practice. And like, and both of those choices are okay, but make it a choice and then be comfortable with that, right? And so I've really latched onto that as a concept. And the, the four categories that she broke it out into that I think map on pretty well for me is um, you've got kind of friends, family, work, and health, right? Like those are kind of the four categories where you can spend time. And, you know, if you want to be really good at something, you can only pick two at any one time. Um, if you want to stretch yourself, you can pick three, right? But the more you pick, the less effective you're going to be in any one. only 24 hours a right? day. Right, yeah, so you're going to be less effective in the other. And so for me, you know, I made a very intentional decision when we started Tribe to focus on kind of work and family, right? Like those were the two things that I decided to focus on. And so, and you know, as part of that, I spend a lot less time with my friends, right? As part of that, I spend a lot less time than I probably would on my health, um, right? And, um, but that's a, a choice that I made and I'm comfortable with it. And so for me, you know, um, that's the way that I think about it in terms of really like granular, how I kind of spend and organize my time. I do fairly regular audits of my calendar. So I'd look at my calendar each week, how much of this on here is contributing to what I want to focus on right now. Right. And I try and eliminate things that don't. Um, I do goal setting every three months. So I have a goal book that I write into and I find that to be really empowering. Um, so I do that. And then um, my wife and I have recently come up with kind of a, a general system that I think works well because she's a stay at home mom, right? Which is a much harder job than what I do. Um, and, you know, so the way that it works is I start work at 830 and I finish at five, right? So those are my hours. I can spend those however I want, right? Obviously, I generally spend them on, on work. And then, you know, if I need to start earlier, right, I have to borrow time, right, that I have to pay back. So like today, I had to start at 730 versus 830. And so, you know, I said, okay, well, I'll give you an hour back from nine to 10 and let you go on a walk or run or whatever, right? Um, or, you know, but then it also works in both directions. Like if she, you know, it's a weekend and she wants to go out with her friends for, you know, the afternoon, it's like, okay, well, you know, that's time that you have to pay back. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, we've got like a ledger going on in our text messages, oh like God. plus 60 minus 30 plus 50. But in a lot of ways, right. As weird as that sounds so romantic yeah, as, as, <laughs> as, as little, ro well, you know, you can forgive debt if you want. Um, uh, but, uh, <laughs> so as, uh, as romantic robotic as that sounds, I think that, uh, think about how often you argue with your spouse about like, oh, I'm like, I'm doing way more work than you are. And, or, oh, like I've been watching the kids for this long and you haven't even watched them in the last two days or whatever it is, right? Like it takes that ambiguity out and more than anything, whether it works or it doesn't, like I think experimenting like that and really being cognizant of how you spend your time is critically important, right? Because it's, it's the only resource that's finite in the long run, right? So- I agree. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking time and putting me in the ledger <laughs> for the day. I greatly appreciate it. Like I said, I've been a longtime fan of yours and what you are creating is truly impacting how businesses are able to reach their community. So thank you for what you do. Uh, we try and congrats again on your success. 
obviously Thank I've been you. a fan as well. And um, so appreciate you bringing, uh, bringing me on. It was fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Bye, Andy. Bye. Thanks again for listening to Coming Clean. And if you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button. Absolutely would love a review. And more importantly, if there is a topic that you'd love for me to address or perhaps a guest you'd love for me to interview, please feel free to email me at comingclean at indylee.com. That's comingclean at indylee.com. See you next time. Bye.